Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm just going to give people uh, another minute or so to join, and then we'll get started. And I see people are adding, yeah, if you could add um, uh, who you are and where you're joining us from, that would be wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to get us started. Uh, welcome to Expanding Our Circle of Compassion, Fishes in the Pet Industry. I'm Liz Cabrera-Holtz, uh, Senior Campaigns Manager at World Animal Protection US. Uh, and again, thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about fishes and what amazing beings they are, as well as how they're exploited by the pet industry and what you can do to help them. Uh, next slide, please. So before we get started, we also want to take a moment to introduce you to World Animal Protection. World Animal Protection is a global nonprofit organization that exposes destructive, exploitative, and cruel systems and provides practical and achievable solutions. We focus on protecting animals in the wild and in farming. Our mission is to move the world to protect animals. And our vision is a world where animals live free from suffering. So today um, we will be talking about fishes sold as pets. So fishes sold as pets are bred in horrific conditions like puppy mills, but for fishes, um, or they're captured from the wild and then shipped to pet stores around the country and, and around the world, um, unfortunately. So many of these animals are doomed to spend their entire lives in tiny tanks or bowls if they survive the process. Uh, fishes are curious, caring animals who deserve our compassion just as much in the, as the dogs and cats we live with, um, but their suffering is often unseen or even ignored. Uh, but that's beginning to change in part thanks to our two wonderful speakers. First, we have Kelly Lavenda. She is the Senior Student Programs Attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. She is a 2013 graduate of Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon. And she has authored numerous articles on fish sentience and welfare and is currently co-authoring the first textbook on aquatic animal law and policy. Then we have Gwendolyn Church, founder and executive director of Friends of Philip Fish Sanctuary, a 501c3 sanctuary focused on fishes and aquatic animals. Friends of Philip is home to over 100 rescued animals of more than 25 species. Um, there'll be some time at the end for questions, so as speakers present, um, feel free to add your questions at any time using the Q&A function. Um, I also want to note before we kind of get started with the program that um, World Animal Protection does not use the word exotic because it's both inaccurate usually and, and harmful to marginalized groups. However, that word is widely used um, in the animal protection space at this moment. So you may occasionally hear it uh, when referring to, for example, veterinarians who provide care for fishes. Uh, next slide, please. So before I hand it over to our speakers, I just wanna give a little bit of background um, into our work protecting animals suffering in the pet industry. For the last several years, we've been urging PetSmart and Petco to stop selling animals because animals don't belong on store shelves, none of them. And even as the phrase adopt, don't shop has gained popularity, you know, pet stores continue to sell animals like turtles, birds, guinea pigs, and fishes. There are so many problems with selling animals in stores or online. There's too many to list right now, um, but you might know that these animals come from mills where they endure horrific treatment. Um, and once they're purchased, some animals, particularly wild animals, are often abandoned outdoors because people have no idea how difficult it is to properly care for a bird or a turtle in a human home. And some of these species live for decades, which only makes it more challenging. Um, if you're interested um, in learning more about our general campaign to end pet store sales, you can check out our previous webinars and Mackenzie will drop those links into the chat. Uh, next slide, please. 
So if you're interested in getting active in the Pet Store campaign, I also have a few actions for you to consider. You can send a message to PetSmart and Petco. Um, the link will be dropped in the chat. You can sign up to send postcards to PetSmart, to PetSmart or Petco. Uh, there's no cost. We'll send you everything you need. We also have a really sweet kids activity book that's free to download with fun games and crosswords. And finally, we have um, a retail pet sales ban toolkit that guides you through the process of working with your local legislators. So legislators um, at the city or county level, working with them to ban the sale of animals in stores. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Kelly. Thank you, Liz, for the introduction and for World Animal Protection for hosting this webinar. And thanks to everyone who's joining us today to learn more about fishes in the pet industry. I will get us started with detailing the aquarium industry, fish sentience, and the legal landscape for fish protection. Um, I will describe my slides for accessibility. Um, this slide says, expanding our circle of compassion, fishes in the pet industry has my name, Animal Legal Defense Fund, and then my email, kaylavenda at aldf.org. If you have any questions that we aren't able to get to in the Q&A um, or want to see any of my research that informs my um, what I say today, you can always email me too. Next slide, please. Um, this slide says global aquarium market and has a photo of a goldfish, a clownfish, a beta fish, and some yellow tropical fish swimming in the ocean. So the U.S. has the highest pet fish population of any country. It's estimated to be 158 million. Most of these are freshwater fish as those are easier to keep in captivity. Um, there's about almost 140 million freshwater fish. And this makes freshwater fish the most popular pet in the U.S. Um, saltwater fish, there's almost 20 million in the U.S. A 2015 study um, showed that U.S. is also the single largest importer of aquarium fish. Um, the U.S. imported at least 10 million fish in 2014, with over 83% of these fish caught from the wild. Um, these are mostly saltwater fish, um, as they cannot be bred in captivity as e easily. And as Liz said, although fishes are the most popular aquatic animal kept as pets, they are not the only aquatic animal species used for companionship. Reptiles such as turtles and certain lizards, amphibians such as frogs, toad, exotals, newts, and salamanders are also commonly kept as pets. Crustaceans like hermit crabs, certain species of lobsters, crayfish, and shrimps are also kept as companion animals. Um, today we will focus mostly on fish though, finfish. Um, the trade in these animals is a multi-billion multi dollar industry. In 2018, the global aquarium fish market was valued at $5 billion and is expected to keep growing. So while we do have an estimation of the pet fish population in the U.S., it's difficult to estimate the total number of fishes and other aquatic animals who are sold in the aquarium trade as pets. The numbers on imports and exports where they exist um, show the picture for the whole aquarium trade, which supplies aquatic animals not only for pets, but also for public aquaria too. Aquarium trade statistics are not fully reported um, and imports and exports of aquatic animals are usually registered by value or weight, not individual animals. This trade encompasses thousands of species over 5,300 species of freshwater fish are sold in the aquarium trade. Um, this includes tetra, goldfish, beta fish, barb, zebra fish, who are also commonly used as research subjects, placo, guppies, and glowfish. And there's over 1,800 species of fishes from at least 125 different families of saltwater fish who are commonly sold in the trade. These include chromis, damselfish, dasilis, yellow and blue tang, angelfish, clownfish, gobies, mandarinfish, and bengai cardlefish. And they are actually an endangered species, uh, but there is some very good news that just came out <laughs> last week on that, which is the US government has announced a proposed rule to ban their import and export. Next slide, please. The slide says fish are sentient and intelligent and has a photo of two primates in a tree together. So a review of the evidence for pain perception strongly suggests that fishes experience pain in a manner similar to other vertebrates. They do have the capacity to be afraid, to feel pain or distress, as well as feel a sense of well-being. 
All evidence suggests that fishes are far more intelligent than we give them credit for. There's a large gap between the public's perception of fish cognition and scientific reality. In fact, fish's perception and cognitive abilities often match or exceed other vertebrates. Many behaviors of primates can even be found in fishes. Now, I don't think intelligence is necessarily <laughs> the best way to evaluate whether you should protect someone, um, but it is something that's used legally to decide when animals get protections, which is why I'm including that here. Fishes also have excellent long-term memories. Um, they can use tools. Catfishes use leaves as a little baby carriage to transport their eggs. They hunt cooperatively, even across species. They learn by observation. Um, they help their friends. They take turns watching the others back while they eat. They will cheat, deceive, eavesdrop on, and even punish each other. And they develop complex traditions and have culture, which means they socially transmit novel behaviors. The most important ability for our discussion is that fishes can learn and remember complex information, which means they are capable of suffering. Overall, the extent of evidence of fishes' behavioral and cognitive sophistication and pain perception suggests that we are morally obligated to protect their welfare. Next slide, please. This photo says, I mean, this slide says fish collection and then has a photo of a diver collecting fish um, by spraying them with cyanide. Um, he's by a coral reef and it's really bleached out from all the cyanide. So where aquatic animals sold in the pet trade are sourced varies substantially based on the type of the species of animal. Saltwater fishes, as I mentioned earlier, are almost exclusively wild caught with 95 to 99% of them um, sold in the aquarium trade coming from the wild. The majority are caught in the oceans off Indonesia, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, the Central Pacific Islands, i.e. Hawaii, the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and the Red Sea regions. So one of the most popular ways to catch fish is through using cyanide as fish exposed to it temporarily lose their ability to swim, um, so they're really easy to catch. It's estimated that up to 90% of saltwater fishes who enter the aquarium trade each year are caught using cyanide. Fish who are squirted with cyanide experience severe gasping and completely lose all respiratory activity, so basically they suffocate, they lose their balance, and many do die. Um, and catching fish with cyanide is also very dangerous for the divers. I, I don't want to forget that either. Some studies estimate that up to 75% of fish who are caught using cyanide die within hours of being taken out of their habitat, and another 30% die before they're even exported out of their home country. Using cyanide to capture fishes also damages the environment. As you can see in this photo, this reef is not doing well. Cyanide causes stress too and bleaches coral reefs and can even kill a whole coral colony. Fishers also commonly break the corals to access the fish who have been sprayed with cyanide, causing substantial destruction to the coral. After collection, fish travel to a local holding facility that are sold to an exporter, ship, ship, usually shipped to a wholesaler in the US and then sold to a store. So this is a pretty long trek for them. This whole process takes days to weeks. And at every new, new location, fish go through the stress of being netted, placed in a tank, maybe placed into a small plastic bag, jostled around during transportation, and then unpacked at each new place. So it's estimated that more than 50% of fish die shortly after they arrive in the US, either due to the effects of cyanide poisoning or the stress from handling and transport. Next slide, please. This slide says breeding fish and has a photo of a goldfish breeding um, facility that's in Indiana. Um, there is a ton of goldfish in a small tank together. Um, so freshwater fishes are mostly bred in captivity with 90% of them coming from commercial aquaculture facilities. Um, as Liz said, these are similar to puppy mills or even factory farms where fish are bred and raised for consumption. Although um, the aquarium fish farms are smaller than the fish factory farms, um, they use similar farming systems. Fish are held in small vats, outdoor ponds, or small indoor tanks at the farm pictured here. Um, they have the same welfare issues um, that factory farms have where the stocking density can be too high. Um, there's fighting and injuries between fish. 
um, the issues with the water chemistry that affects their health, etc. Uh, in the U.S., um, many fish sold in the aquarium trade are farmed in Florida. Um, but this photo pictured here is from Indiana's large goldfish farm. Um, it's a facility in Martinsville, Indiana, and contains over 600 ponds and sells over 40 million fish annually. Um, this facility is the largest breeder of goldfish and koi in the U.S. Um, during peak season, up to 400,000 fish hatch every day at this farm. Um, globally, Countries in Asia, like Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, China, Malaysia, and Japan, um, and countries in Europe, like Czech Republic, Spain, Israel, Belgium, and Holland, specialize in farming aquarium fish. Next slide, please. This slide says fish welfare and has a photo of a goldfish that seems like it's photoshopped in a really small bowl. So poor animal care is common for non-domesticated or wild animals who are kept as pets. Fish often experience poor water quality at home in proper water chemistry. So the temperature, pH, and ionic composition of the water have to be correct. Um, stress, pathogens, boredom, poor water quality, poor quality or insufficient amounts of food or, or competition for food if they're held in a community tank and improper enrichment, tank size, stocking density, or an otherwise unsuitable living environment. Um, so Gwendolyn will go into this more um, when she talks about the rescue stories. Um, and poor animal welfare leads to really high mortality rates. Um, fish have annual mortality rates of over 90%. Next slide, please. This slide says legal landscape and has a photo of a really Hopkin coral reef um, with tons of fish swimming around and interacting. So there are state and federal laws that may protect fish who are used as companion animals. Um, I guess the two big things that we look for in animal law are whether the law that we're looking at applies to the type of animal that we want it to cover. And if it does, is it enforced very well? So on the state level, criminal anti-cruelty laws um, are state laws that protect some animals, usually companion animals, from cruelty and neglect. The species covered under these state laws depend on the state's definition of animal. Some states have very broad definitions, such as like every living creature, which presumably applies to aquatic species, including fish, reptiles, and amphibians. Some states have more specific definitions, only including a mammal, bird, reptile, or amphibian in their definition. Unfortunately, um, in a 50 state survey that I completed, most states either fish are not protected by these laws or it's unclear whether they are protected. And then the enforcement of this <laughs> is a whole other issue. On the federal level, the Lacey Act, which is what's passed in 1900. Um, that's a federal statute that creates civil and criminal penalties for traffic and wildlife who have been illegally taken, possessed, transported, or sold. Um, this does apply to fish, um, but in my research, I could not find many instances of it being enforced um, to protect fishes in the aquarium trade. Next slide, please. This slide says Hawaii fish collection and has a photo of a yellow tang. Since the mid 1970s, the aquarium industry has taken more than 8.5 million fish from the West Hawaii waters. Um, this photo is a yellow tang, which are Hawaii's most collected aquarium species representing well over half of Hawaiian aquarium exports by val volume and value over the last two decades. Um, the pet aquarium industry and interest groups like the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council have fought hard to keep aquarium collectors harvest effectively limitless and restriction free in Hawaii. In 2012, um, Native Hawaiians and conservation groups represented by Earth Justice sued the state for failing to use its power under the Hawaii Environmental Policy Act to regulate the aquarium industry. Um, so this is an example of using uh, environmental protection law to actually to help protect animals. Um, this case kind of took a long time to wind its way through the courts. In 2018, the judge ruled that all commercial aquarium fishing would be completely banned in the state of Hawaii until a proper environmental impact statement was completed. 
In 2020, um, they did complete that statement, um, but the board rejected the final environmental impact statement and completely banned um, the industry from collecting fish. Um, this was a really great win. Um, this is advocates and um, folks in Hawaii have been trying to get there for years. Um, there was actually legislation passed in 2017 that banned um, collection, but it was actually vetoed by the governor. Um, so in 2020, two well-known West Hawaii aquarium fish collectors were arrested and the 235 fish of the 10 different species that they had collected were returned to the water. Um, they were worth an estimated value of $24,730 and the collectors were fined $272,000. Unfortunately, this didn't last long. In, by 2022, the state did accept a revised environmental impact statement, which would allow issuing aquarium collection permits for fish collection. Um, but in my research, it does not look like any permits have yet been issued. Um, so, and the legislature is considering a bill that would ban collection permanently. So some pretty good news out of Hawaii. Next slide, please. Oh, and I, I did also want to mention our thoughts are with all those affected by the Maui uh, wildfires. I'm sure lots of us have been watching those in the news. Um, this slide says beta fish lawsuit and has a photo of a blue and red beta fish. Um, so there are creative ways to use laws to help improve the welfare of fish. One way is using consumer protection laws. Um, these have functioned as a mechanism for protecting the public against unfair trade practices that result in harm to buyers. Such laws have used, been used to protect animals by requiring businesses to meet certain standards for the animals they sell to consumers and have granted consumers standing to initiate lawsuits when businesses violate these standards. In 2018, Petco, Aquion, and Hagen Aquarium products were sued for engaging in unlawful trade practices and deceptive advertising for selling beta fish aquariums of less than 1.5 gallons, arguing that they do not provide healthy housing for fish and cause them to die much sooner, usually from ammonia excretion, than if they were kept in a larger appropriately sized aquarium. Um, this lawsuit did settle and the settlement is private, so I wasn't able to find that. Um, usually they would settle a lawsuit by, like this by either paying the class members or even agreeing to change what products they sell. Um, so I did poke around on the Petco website. Um, there is an Equion beta tank that is 1.6 gallons, um, but it does include a filter at least. Um, but there are still a few Petco brand tanks that are less than 1.5 gallons, although one does have a filter. Um, thank you for your time. I'm going to pass it on to Gwendolyn now. Thank you, Kelly, for the, uh, the introduction and transition here. Um, and thank you, World Animal Protection, for hosting this webinar and, and giving us this opportunity to, to talk a little bit more about fishes. Um, so as Liz said in the beginning, uh, my name is Gwendolyn Church. I'm the founder and executive director of Friends of Philip Fish Sanctuary. We are a um, 501c3 aquatic animal sanctuary located in Reno, Nevada. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the most common questions I get largely from outside the animal protection movement, but from inside too, is why fish? Why do we have a sanctuary focused on fish? Um, why are we rescuing fishes? And, you know, Kelly talked a lot about the um, physiology and the capabilities of fishes, so I won't spend too long on this, but ultimately, um, you know, there are currently over 33,000 known species of fish um, that all have unique experiences and, and physiology. And the, that 33,000 species accounts for over 60% of all the known vertebrate species on Earth. Um, so with that, fishes are by far the most consumed food animal. Um, they're the most numerous pet animal, and they're really second only to mice in the numbers used for scientific research. And despite these really kind of staggering numbers, they're also the least represented in animal advocacy and in animal rescue. Uh, so that's a bit of why we focus on fish. Uh, next slide, please. A bit more of why we focus on fish is because of one individual fish um, who was named Philip. So Philip was our first rescue. Um, he was surrendered to me from a large chain pet store. And you can see there on the top left is his um, kind of before photo of what he looked like when I found him on the shelf. Um, the bottom photo, of course, is his kind of recovery photo and how he looked for the remainder of his life with us. 
Um, Philip was with us for about four years. He passed away just earlier this year. Um, but he is really a huge part of the motivation for our continued rescue of, of fishes and our focus on aquatic life in general. So I rescued Philip in 2019, and then we became an organization, Friends of Philip, in 2020. Um, my fiance and the entire sanctuary uh, moved to Reno, Nevada in 2021. Um, and then we incorporated as a 501c3 just earlier this year. Next slide, please. So I wanted to go into our philosophy um, as kind of, you know, what, what we are as a sanctuary and what we stand for. So really we follow the farmed animal sanctuary or micro sanctuary model, um, which means that we're anti-speciesist, vegan, and anti-oppression. So we, we always aim for absolutely no breeding of animals. This looks quite a bit different for fishes than for farmed animals, um, just because of the variety of species. Um, but we do, you know, we do not ever breed our animals here. Um, we also give priority to the physical and emotional safety and the well-being of the residents, which means, you know, designing tanks and layouts and things so that the fishes don't have to experience and interact with us if they don't want to, or that we aren't ever keeping fishes in tanks that are overcrowded um, or with, re you know, with residents who may not get along or species that may not get along and, and things like that. Additionally, we um, never purchase animals from for-profit sources. So um, any fish who comes to us from a store was fully surrendered from that store. We, we don't ever purchase them. Um, and kind of at a, at a fundamental level, we focus on collective liberation and creating a space where both human and non-human animals can be free of exploitation and oppression. Next slide, please. So there are really two main sources for where our residents come from. Um, the first is store rescue, which is what, really what I'm going to focus on. Um, and then the second is, is caregiver surrender. So caregiver surrender is um, just what it sounds like. It's kind of a private surrender from someone who is keeping a fish or fishes and can't keep them for any number of reasons. Um, store rescues are surrenders from chain or small pet stores or small fish stores um, for fishes who are there in poor health. And really whether or not a fish can be or will be surrendered is dependent on both the store policy and the manager discretion. Um, but we do have quite a bit of success with getting stores to surrender sick fishes to us. And really tragically, um, you know, only about 50 to 60% of those fishes who come to us from stores will survive long-term. The majority um, who do pass away will usually pass away within the first day to week um, from arriving. And that's because they arrive in such poor condition. So um, I'll just give a little warning. The next slide has some kind of um, rough photos of fishes who have been surrendered to us. So just be prepared for that. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So these are all photos of fishes who have been surrendered to us from pet stores. Um, and to give you a little bit of perspective, you know, this is no, by no means all of the fishes who have been surrendered to us from pet stores, but of the um, photos here, only two of these fishes are still with us. Um, the remainder passed away either in the first week or the one little betta on the right, um, he passed away after a couple months. So this is the condition that fish end up after living in the pet store and after going through everything that Kelly talked about with the transport and all of the stress that comes from their lives prior to the store and their lives at the store. Next slide, please. And here's just a little high point of some of the recovery photos of our fishes. So it, it shows you, you know, the contrast between what a fish might look like when they're kept in really poor conditions and then the recovery that they can have um, when, when they're given the proper care. Um, next slide, please. This is just a cute little video, um, if we could play it real quick, of uh, one of our late residents, Rue. Um, Rue was a female betta who um, was surrendered to me from a, a large chain pet store. Um, and she was a unique case because I actually found her um, on the, the kind of shelf of bettas and she was stuck on the plastic of the cup out of the water. Um, and when I got her home and tested the water, I found it was because the water quality was so, so, so bad. It was the worst I'd ever seen. And she was trying to jump out of the cup to save her own life. Um, and of course she didn't know um, that she was trapped there and couldn't get away. Um, next slide, please. So these are a few kind of generic photos of what you will see in pet stores and the conditions that fishes are housed in. Um, they're intentionally built to look kind of flashy and 
and nice um, because it, it lets the, the true conditions kind of hide away a little bit, I think. And on the left, there's the betta fish display, um, which this is the standard practice for selling bettas in the United States where each fish is kept in an individual little plastic cup of water. Um, this display is particularly bad because each cup also has a bright light directly underneath the cup, um, which leads to really significantly more stress for the fish who's living in the cup and who can't escape from that bright light. Um, on the right, there's this giant tank wall, which is also the kind of standard practice for the sale of tropical and community species. Um, and these tanks, you can see there's not much in the way of decorations and things in there because, of course, the store wants people to be able to see the fish. And so um, the fishes are, are feeling very stressed and exposed. Um, overcrowding, of course, is very common where there's far too many fish in a single tank for the tank size. Um, and one of the, the most kind of dangerous thing that's, things that's actually happening literally in the background of this is that each section of this wall, maybe five or six tanks, is going to be sharing a water system in the background. So they all have a single shared sump, which means that the water from every tank is pumped through every other tank at some you know, rate, depending on the pump system, which means that when a single fish is sick, every single other fish in that entire system is exposed to that illness. So you have the stress of overcrowding, you have the inevitable introduction of disease. Um, and then when fishes die, which they do daily, um, the fish are, are there then living in the water where a fish has died, which of course increases ammonia and all sorts of toxic um, waste products in the water. So the, the tank walls and, and the displays might look a little bit innocent, but they're really incredibly, incredibly dangerous and terrible for the fish. Um, and one of the worst components of this is that the fishes live here until either, of course, they die in the tanks at the store, or they're sold to someone who may or may not understand really the care that the fish actually needs. And within the pet store, um, when these fishes come in sick, there's really not a whole lot that the store can or will um, allow to be done to help the fishes. Um, I have never encountered a, a pet store that provides veterinary care for their fishes. Uh, most pet stores will tell you they have policies around vet care and things like that, but um, they're also literally pulling, you know, five to 10 or more dead fishes out of the tank wall every day. So it's not super feasible um, and the stores are not going to provide veterinary care. Um, so next slide, please. I did um, with that want to spend a minute talking about aquatic veterinary care because um, I think many people, and this was myself included when I started rescuing fishes, don't really think about aquatic vets or aquatic veterinary care as even really a thing. Um, but there are specialized aquatic veterinarians who do see and treat fish exclusively. Um, and of course, with any sanctuary for either um, aquatic or terrestrial animals, medical care is an absolutely critical component of, of sanctuary. Um, unfortunately, aquatic veterinary care can be difficult to access depending on where you live because there aren't very many aquatic veterinarians. Um, so if you do have fishes or you're thinking of rescuing fishes, another option that you can pursue is to look for um, either exotics vets. Um, you know, Liz talked about the, the word exotic and, and everything that we try not to use that. Um, but really, if, if you're looking for a fish, a vet who might see a fish, that's kind of what you need to Google is, is exotics vets. These are the vets who typically see small animals like, you know, guinea pigs, hamsters, reptiles, and very occasionally they will also see fishes. Um, another option is that there are some aquatic vets who will do consultations with non-aquatic vets to help that vet to treat a fish. Um, our vet will do that, um, which is excellent. Um, so, um, you know, that that's another option to pursue if you have a fish and, and don't have access specifically to a, to a vet for them. Next slide, please. Um, and so for aquatic veterinary care, it, I think it can be difficult sometimes to, to think of what a, an exam or treatment for a fish might look like, but really it's it's very similar and, and almost identical to terrestrial care with the exception that your patient is in the water. Um, so our vet will perform general wellness exams. She gives us dietary and environmental guidance for our tank setups and the food that our fishes are eating. Um, all exams and treatments are done with sedation and pain relief. Um, we also have access to labs, including blood tests and cytology and, and, you know, all the kinds of labs that you would see with a terrestrial animal. Um, there's also options for imaging. So we've had x-rays and ultrasounds done on several of our fishes. 
Um, and there is an, an Oscar at a, uh, a sanctuary in Ohio who just recently received a CT scan. So there's all kinds of things available for fishes. And then, of course, a vet can always prescribe um, medications of antibiotics, antiparasitics, antivirals, um, you know, all of the same kinds of things that you would see for terrestrial animals. And then surgery is an option for fishes as well. Um, our vet sees a very large number of koi, and she often does surgeries to remove um, ovarian tumors from koi because they're very susceptible to that. So surgeries and, and all kinds of treatments are available for fishes. Next slide, please. Um, so finally, in the last bit here, I'm just going to walk through a few of our residents and introduce you to them and, and share their stories um, and, you know, just help you learn a little bit more about some of the, the fishes who live here. Next slide, please. So this is Petey. Um, Petey is a baby peacock cichlid. He was a pet store rescue. Um, he was in one of those tanks on that big kind of wall of tanks that I showed earlier. There were probably 50 cichlids in this tank where size-wise I wouldn't even keep Petey in it by himself. Um, and so he had been, you know, he was one of the smallest in there. He'd been beat up pretty severely. You can see the top photo there. It's, it's not super easy to see, but his fins are very ragged. He had a few substantial wounds on his body, and he was actually completely missing his left pectoral fin. Um, he's since recovered. The bottom photo shows him about a month ago. He's still, he's getting bigger, so he's a bit bigger now. Um, but we expect he's around somewhere around six months old, um, and he could live for six to 10 years. So we hope that Petey will be with us for a very long time. Um, Petey is a variety of African cichlid, and these fishes are native to Lake Malawi in Eastern Africa, but any cichlid that you encounter in the pet trade is almost guaranteed to be captive bred. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a little video of Petey. Um, you can see he's a bit bigger than he was in the photo. This is him exercising some of his natural behaviors, which in the wild, a male cichlid will um, pick up and rearrange sand to build nests and mark territory. So. Um, all of our cichlids, we have three, have sand and rocks in their tanks so that they can, um, you know, kind of simulate their natural environment and exercise those natural behaviors. Next slide, please. So this is Goji. Um, Goji is one of our bettas. He was also a pet store surrender. Um, and Goji's story is pretty much in line with almost all of the bettas who live here. We have a few bettas who were caregiver surrenders, but the majority of them were store rescues. Um, so you can see in the top the top photo there, Goji was very thin, he was very pale, um, and his fins were incredibly rotted away. Uh, so the kind of long, tenderly looking appearance to his fins is normal for the breed of betta that Goji is. It's called a crown tail. But um, in the top photo, the way that his fins end in kind of a dark, rounded looking thing, that that is fin rot, which is a result of stress, poor diet, poor water quality, all of the things that he was encountering every single day in that cup on the shelf. Um, so most of the bettas sold in pet stores are probably between three to six months old or up to a year. Um, and the typical lifespan for a betta is anywhere from two to five years. And there have been some instances of bettas living to be as old as eight. Um, there's a huge variety there in part or almost entirely um, because of, of breeding practices and just inconsistency and, and unhealthy breeding practices, um, along with, of course, all of the stress and the, you know, the problems that they deal with um, going through the transportation and living in the stores, and then likely not being adopted and or rescued into a place that gives them proper care and instead maybe living their life in a tiny tank. Um, so bettas are native to Southeast Asia. Um, where they live or are found largely in shallow ponds, streams, and rice paddies. So that natural environment is part of what has perpetuated the myth that bettas can live in those little tiny tanks um, because they have adapted um, to be able to survive periods of extreme drought by living in these small puddles. Um, but that's a survival mechanism. It's not their natural way of living. They normally live, you know, the, the typical... Um, uh, territory for a male betta in the wild is, is about, you know, a three by three by three, so 27 cubic feet um, of space. So they they really take a lot of space in the wild. Um, and any betta that you see in the pet store or any betta that looks similar to goji with the bright colors, 
you know, red or giant fins or anything like that, those are absolutely captive bred. That is um, the result of generations of breeding for appearance. Next slide, please. Um, so next is Stuart. Stuart is our figure eight puffer and he is our only brackish fish. Uh, so Stuart was also a pet store surrender. He was marked unsaleable uh, because of a large bump over his eye, which you can see a little bit in this photo. Um, his, it's over his right eye. Um, so on the left side of the photo, there's that bump. Um, and the pet store decided they couldn't sell him because of that. So they let me take him home. Um, our vet did examine the bump and, and looked at it. She um, sedated him and cut him to, into it a tiny bit to see if she could determine what it was. But because it was so close to his eye, there wasn't much that we could do. Um, and then the bump just completely went away on its own within about three weeks or so. Um, so we don't know exactly how old Stuart is. Um, we hope that he's still fairly young and will be with us for a long time, um, which could be up to 15 years or maybe longer if we're lucky. Um, and we don't know how old Stuart is because all figure eight puffers are wild caught. Um, so Stuart is native to the brackish tide tidewaters of Southeast Asia. Um, and you know a lot of the same capture practices that um, Kelly was talking about in Hawaii, that's standard everywhere. So Stuart was pulled from the wild at some point, um, and he was likely one of the very few who actually survived to get to a store and be um, be purchased, or in this case, rescued. Um, next slide, please. So this is a little video of Stuart. Um, he is a goofy little fish. He is not a big fan of my cell phone. Actually, quite a few fishes aren't. Um, so you can see he's incredibly skeptical of me here. He's hanging out towards the back of the tank. He doesn't really, you know, want to come towards me or anything. Um, and that's pretty standard for um, a puffer fish. They're incredibly sensitive. Um, actually, a fun little fact about Stuart is that he hates the color red. If I wear a red shirt or anything red into the fish room, he will dart away and sometimes literally try to jump out of his tank. So I don't wear red if I can help it. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the last introduction is our goldfish crew. This is a, a pretty significant number of fishes. We have um, just over 25 goldfish who live here, and they come from a huge variety of sources. Um, most of our goldfish were um, caregiver surrenders. Um, the few goldfish who I have convinced stores to surrender to me were in such poor health that they did pass away quite quickly. Um, but we have a, a huge number of you know, different stories for our goldfish. Um, actually, the entire group here on the photo on the right, um, they were abandoned in aquariums outside in Sacramento um, a few years ago now um, in the middle of a giant heat wave. So if you can imagine being in a greenhouse on a hot day, um, these fishes were in that, but it, you know, with absolutely no escape. Um, so luckily, we were able to coordinate with some people there and rescue them, and now they are living here. Um, and we also have goldfish who came to us that were won as um, carnival prizes. We have goldfish who were purchased as quote-unquote starter fish because the people didn't realize um, exactly what a goldfish needs. Um, because something significant to note here is that a, a goldfish, like the common ones in this photo, can live for 15 or 20 years or more in some cases, and they can grow to be over a foot long. So the care needs for a goldfish are, are really quite extensive, um, but not, you know, it's not very common knowledge. It's not informed by the, the pet industry or the stores where people get these fish. Um, goldfish are native to Eastern Asia and parts of Europe. Um, and any goldfish that you see in the pet store is going to be captive bred. They come from those giant facilities that, you know, Kelly showed us a photo of um, where they are essentially factory farmed um, for sale. And goldfish, they're sold either as pet fish, they're sold as feeder fish, they're often given as prizes for things like carnival games and, and things like that. Um, and there's really just all kinds of brutal uses um, for goldfish, unfortunately, um, in part because they're very resilient and they breed very easily so they can be sold very cheaply. Um, and that's all that I have um, for Friends of Philip. So if we go to just the last slide, I have one little video of some of our goldfish. Um, this one, the goldfish here in the center is Goldie. Uh, she was surrendered to us from a person who had won her as a carnival prize and then kept her for years, um, but wanted her to, to have a better place where she could have friends. So this is her with her friends and um, Kind of an exciting 
thing that's happening right now is we just had the uh, the pretty large hole dug for a pond that we're putting in outside that all of our goldfish will get to live in. Um, so thank you so much, and uh, I'll give it back to Liz. Thank you so much, um, Gwendolyn and Kelly. Um, that was really moving, powerful, um, and sometimes difficult information to hear. So we really appreciate um, you both taking the time to share it with us. It looks like we have tons of questions, so it's good we have a little bit of time. So um, let's just get started. Speakers, you can both um, come on camera, um, but you can stay muted unless you're speaking. So first, I have a question for Gwendolyn, and I'm kind of going to combine them. But um, so we're getting tons of questions about like technical aspects of your sanctuary. So could you like some things like, do you have a generator from the power goes out? How do you manage intake without being completely overwhelmed? Um, how many tanks do you have if you want to just take a minute or two to, to talk about some of those things? Sure. Um, so we do not currently have a generator. It's the top of the list of things to get before the winter coming up, um, because the main concern um, for the tanks would be um, the heaters, actually. So people would think of the pumps. Um, we have few enough fishes in our tanks and enough you know, manpower with me and my fiance that if our filters stopped working, we could be doing water changes and keeping up to make sure that the water quality is okay. The main concern would be if our power shut off and our house got so cold that the tanks for the tropical fishes dropped too low and they would all die. So we're absolutely getting a, um, a generator. We have really very consistent power in our area, so we're very lucky. Um, but yeah, a generator is, is very high on that list. Um, and so I think then the next question was um, intakes. Um, so yeah, we, just how you manage that. Yeah, we get many, many intake requests. Um, we're the only sanctuary that I know of um, who takes in fishes um, and, you know, in, in our area for sure. Um, and a lot of the time we just kind of have to say no. You know, it, there's a balance there of not taking in so many fishes that we're compromising the care that our current residents receive um, and keeping our current residents safe and healthy. So I will never take in a fish if I don't have the space and the resources to keep them for their entire life, which like for a goldfish is a bit of a larger decision than for someone like a betta who's a bit smaller and may not live quite as long. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time there is, you know, that kind of gut wrenching feeling of having to say no. Um, Another aspect that we consider is our quarantine space because um, quarantine, I didn't talk about it with the vet care stuff, but it is a critical component of fish rescue and anything related to fishes is you absolutely have to quarantine. So if we don't have the quarantine space, we can't take in additional fish. Um, and then I think the last one was around the number of tanks and things. So we have, um, it's funny because I always have to count, but we have, um, Currently over 20 aquariums. Um, the number does kind of fluctuate a little bit with um, especially quarantine tanks, because of course quarantine happens in a fully separate tank, but we have temporary tanks for that that we set up and tank down, take down. Um, but yeah, most of our tanks right now are for bettas because they live individually. So we have um, quite a few smaller tanks with a single betta living in each one. And then we have two larger community tanks. Um, we have three cichlid tanks. Um, we have one frog. We have one frog tank for our African dwarf frogs, um, and then we have a few stock tanks for our goldfish, who will all move into the pond that I had talked about in just a few months. Great, thank you, Gwendolyn. Um, the next question is for Kelly. So we've, yeah, as I said before, we've learned a lot of difficult difficult things about fishes and in, in the reality they're living in right now. And as a legal expert, do you think? attitudes about fishes have changed since you started? Do you have hope for the future? I could say definitely. So I started writing on this issue fish in about 10 years ago. <laughs> and since then, I mean, basically all that stuff in Hawaii has happened in the last 10 years. Um, fish are definitely, I would say in the animal protection movement in general are getting more, um, time time and advocacy dedicated to them which is amazing obviously friends of philip have started <laughs> in the last few years too um and there's been an aquatic animal law class at lewis and clark um that started a few years ago 
Um, and there's the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative. It used to be at Lewis and Clark, but now it's at George Washington University in DC. Um, so I definitely see a lot of interest from students in this issue. And I think it definitely helps having kind of like the environmental tie-ins. Um, Lewis and Clark has an animal law program. So they have um, wildlife courses. And in that we did talk a lot about fish, um, especially because we're in the Northwest and there's lots of issues with salmon and orcas and things that are happening over here. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely hopeful for the future and seeing a lot of change. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Well, on that note, this is a question for both Gwendolyn and Kelly. We're getting lots of variations on the question of what we should do. One person had a cool idea that they think, and I agree, is probably illegal <laughs> about placing stickers like on the bed of cups and pet stores being like, beware, or like, this is cruelty. <laughs> um, but in that vein, what um, we'll start with Gwendolyn and then move to Kelly because I think you have really, um, you know, unique perspectives. Um, what what is some what are some impactful things people can do to help these fishes? That's a great question. Um, I like the the sticker idea. I think that's clever. Um, and I think a, a big thing is just continuing to talk to people and spread this information. Um, a lot of people just don't think about fishes at all. Um, you know the the thing that I think is is tragic and that is real across all farmed animals is that the most common interaction that people have with a farmed animal, including fishes, is when that animal is on their plate. Um, so our most common exposure to fishes in the pet industry is if you don't have fishes, it's either at someone's house when you encounter a fish who may or may not be well cared for, or it's when you walk into the pet store and you see them dying there. Um, so I think just you know, having those conversations and sharing the information. Um, and, you know, I know World Animal Protection, you guys shared that the um, kind of toolkit that you have, I think all of that is great to just keep raising awareness and, and sharing this information with people because so few people really think about it. And I always encourage people to just use their talents for animal advocacy. So if you're an artist, you can create art based on, you know, based on animal rights. Um, if you're good at social media and communications, you can create an Instagram pa you know, page and start educating about these issues. Like, um, so just wherever you think that you can fit in, I would encourage it. Um, people do ask whether you should go to law school. Um, and I would answer only if you want to be a lawyer. <laughs> So there's tons of other ways to get involved and even work with an animal law. I mean, at our organization, we have a comms team and a legislative affairs team. You know, a lot of non-attorneys also work in animal legal defense fund. Um, so there's, yeah, tons of ways to get involved. Um, if we have any jobs that are open, I would go to aldf.org slash jobs. We might have a couple open right now. Thank you both. Um, I think uh, this is very difficult to choose because really um, a, a testament to you both. This is one of the most engaged um, chats and Q&As we've ever had. So I feel bad, but um, one question, I guess, to bring it back because betta fish are so exploited by the pet industry, maybe Gwendolyn, you could speak a little bit more about where these fish come from, what they experience before getting to the pet stores. And just, I know I know you both have covered this a bit, but just to take a minute to, to talk about that a bit more and, and what they endure. Sure. Um, so just like other fishes, bettas are bred in mass. Um, there are pretty substantial breeding facilities in Southeast Asia in particular. Um, so quite a few bettas will be shipped from overseas. Um, maybe Kelly could comment more on, on if the kind of United States supply of bettas comes from overseas or not, um, but that, that is pretty common. Um, a unique thing with, with bettas, though, is that, um, you know, they're separated into cups and the pet stores will tell you that that's necessary because they can't be kept together because they'll fight, um, which is true. Um, bettas were originally domesticated for fighting, and so at these farming facilities, um, bettas have to be separated once they reach a certain age. And so then, you know, they can't be shipped in a large bag of fish because they would all fight. And so instead, bettas are shipped in, um, it's like smaller than like a sandwich bag. You know, you think of like this teeny tiny plastic bag with with literally tablespoons of water is what these fishes are shipped in. Um, and so stores will receive a giant box of these little tiny bags. And then some um, worker has to go in there and open every bag throw away the dead fishes and then put the ones who survived into those little cups. Um, so from a certain age, 
they're kept in just tiny amounts of water until they're purchased and likely still kept in tiny amounts of water once they are purchased. So it's, it's really, truly awful. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, yeah, with the time, I'm sorry, I won't be able to get to everyone's questions, but um, I think you both, if if it's not been shared, you can find both um, Animal Legal Defense Fund and Gwendolyn Sanctuary on Instagram and, and online. So I'd encourage both of you to follow follow them to, to get updates on their work um, and you know perhaps interact with them on social media, especially Gwendolyn, uh, who has a really, really awesome Instagram for her sanctuary. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, before we wrap up, I just want to say um, thank you again to everyone who joined us um, and thank you to our speakers. Um, we will be sharing the webinar recording with everyone who's here now and anyone who registered. Um, we'd also love to have you join um, World Animal Protection's work. So again, you can send a message to PetSmart and Petco Executives. You can download our real retail toolkit. Um, you could sign our Wildlife Not Pets pledge. You can also become a supporter of World Animal Protection. Um, and all these uh, links, again, are being dropped into the chat, or you can use that QR code. Um, so with that, I think we're going to bring it to a close. Thank you again to Kelly and Gwendolyn, and we hope we see you at our next webinar. Bye.